I've been taking a look at the Home Assistant 2025.11 release and it looks like the team have been hard at work yet again making improvements and adding some much needed functionality. There are some really nice features this time around which I'm sure many will appreciate but there's also quite a few breaking changes so make sure you stick around because I'm going to be breaking down everything you need to know about this release. Hey everyone, my name's Simon and welcome to a new video on Byte of Geek, a channel that's all about home assistant and smart home technology. So I've been checking out what's due to arrive in the November release of Home Assistant and again it's a mixed bag of new features, further improvements, new integrations, but most importantly there are a lot of breaking changes. Now, as I always mention in these release videos, this is a beta release of Home Assistant and as such, it's subject to change. In fact, this time around, there are still some sections to be finalized in the release notes. So there is potential here for even further new functionality to be added, which makes checking the release notes even more important. So as always, I'll put a link in the description of this video, should you want to go and read about it in more detail. Right then, so let's check out what's in store for the November release of Home Assistant. So off we go with the new features, and I've mentioned this in the previous videos, the team are working really hard on making automations easier via the UI. So again, it's no surprise to see some updates and additions in this release for those areas. First off, well, we have a new target picker, which makes it a lot easier to determine where a device has come from. Certainly, if you've got a lot of uh, similar devices, say temperature sensors, for example, well, now you can easily see what area or floor they are in. Or maybe you want to turn devices off in a specific area or floor, well, now it's a lot clearer. As you can see in this before and after footage, it's quite the change from how it was in the previous version. Next, we've got changes to the automation editor, and I think this looks really good. Bigger dialogue, very clear what the intent is and what can be done rather than the smaller dialogue we're used to, and the building blocks now are on the same dialogue as well. So where you previously had to choose either a block or a condition, uh, and that was it, well, now you can flick between them quite easily. Next up, we've got a nice improvement for naming entities on your dashboard. Basically, it's a name builder. You can select, for example, the area and the entity and your card will display that as the name. I think this is a pretty cool uh, thing to have and brings it in line with how you can build up the secondary information. You still have the option to use your own custom name if you want to. And if you rename a device or entity, then everything automatically updates itself and keeps everything in sync. I think these are great additions and improvements, and if you do too, then hit the like button or drop something in the comments. Now, if you're bored of the line bar for the device's energy graph, well, now you've got a new pie chart option to play with, allowing you to toggle between the two layouts. I've got to say, I love the animation as it switches between the two. It's very, very slick. And finally, a bit of an update to the update dialogue when you're updating Home Assistant Core and add-ons to give you a better overall indication of total progress as it downloads and unpacks the update onto your system. Now, there's plenty of new integrations and improvements to existing ones this month. So starting off, we've got a new Firefly 3 integration. So this is an open source personal finance manager with lots of cool stuff like budgeting and transactions and reports. So nice to try that one out on your system. Next up, we have uh, Meteo.lt, uh, which is going to provide regional weather uh, forecasts for locations in Lithuania. If you're a user of Dali Lighting Systems, well, now there is a Lunatone gateway so that you can integrate into Lunatone's Dali gateway interface. Next up is an integration for Nintendo Parental Controls, allowing you to connect Home Assistant to Nintendo's parental management service to monitor and manage device usage. I can see that coming in super handy when the kids won't go to sleep. If you're an owner of an Actron air conditioner, well, now there is a new integration, conveniently called 
Actron Air and the Open RGB project has been brought to Home Assistant with the new Open RGB integration, which will allow you to have a unified control of RGB lighting across a range of hardware brands and devices. If you use the iNEL Smart Home System, then you'll be pleased to hear that there is a new integration for that. So now you can manage lighting, heating, and automation components. I use the Fing mobile app and I find it quite useful for network scanning and seeing what's on my network. So it's great to see that there is a new integration for that. And finally, there is a Dali Center, which has been added, allowing you to integrate with Dali Center and be able to manage and monitor Dali-based lighting systems. Now onto the updates to existing integrations, and there's quite a few here. So I'm just picking out some of the key ones. So we've got the uh, SwitchBot integration has been updated to add a garage door opener. The Volvo integration has had device tracker and buttons added to it. And if you've got Unify equipment and it has LED support, well, now you can control that as well. As I say, that's just some of the updates this month. Check out the link in the description of this video to see all of the updates as it really is quite extensive. As for notable changes in this version, well, the release notes are still being finalized, but it sounds like there are quite a few to look forward to. Those that we do know about are all related to the new home dashboard that was introduced recently. And those are what I would class as general improvements and organization updates, just to make things a little clearer for people to use. So we've got the uh, suggested entities and favorites uh, being combined to a single section now, areas being grouped by floor, and then light, climate, and safety views have been moved to, the, to their own dedicated panels, which you can access under dashboards in the settings option. With this release, there are a lot of items listed under breaking changes. So I'm going to go through these slightly different to previous update videos. It's also fair to say that a lot of these will have been mentioned previously as items being deprecated. So if you're updating to this release, then you would better have updated your scripts and automations by now. Otherwise, you'll have a huge headache to deal with. So I'm going to start with those integrations that have been removed. And in this category, we have uh, Volta. So if you're using that to access your VPS subscription details, well, that has now gone, uh, as has the IBM Watson IoT platform integration. If you're using the Plum LightPad integration to control your Wi-Fi light switch, that has now been removed. And finally, the Neato integration has been removed as of this release as well. Next up, we have integrations that have had deprecated features removed. So if you're using these, uh, then they're all likely to need you to update your scripts and automations when you update to this release. So to start with, we have the lock integration has had deprecated state constants removed. Uh, the deprecated constants from media player have been removed. Deprecated constants within the uh, camera integration have been removed and the deprecated entity feature constants in the vacuum integration have also been removed. The previously deprecated template action function has been removed, so you'll need to update any custom templates to use the new attach API instead. Uh, deprecated cover state constants have been removed. It's being able to directly set state in the alarm control panel has now been removed. The extra attributes in the Fritz box climate integration have also been removed. And finally, the config source has been removed from the core system. So you'll need to make sure any custom integrations no longer refer to that. And in terms of general breaking changes, well, we've got the following. So the supervisor will no longer write any log files directly to the uh, configuration directory. So this is apparently being done to improve the separation of managed and user controlled files. The Oral-B integration has had uh, translations and icons added. Uh, if you're validating schemas outside of an event loop, well, they are now going to fail. So you'll need to ensure that that is all done within the loop. The Mealy integration, not to be confused with the appliance manufacturer, now requires Mealy V2 or later. 
uh, and this next one is likely to cause a few headaches but the tilt direction for motion blinds has been reversed so that it aligns with standard behavior i'm expecting a few people to get caught out with that one the async track template result now requires a has instance when called within a template and async config entry uh, first refresh now requires a value config entry so any custom components will need to be updated to ensure that they're using that. The Nederlandse Spoorwegen integration now reports departure and arrival times as timestamps, so likely a few templates will need to be updated there. The Renault integration now uses the Renault API version 0.5.0. The Asus WRT device tracker last time reachable extra attribute has been removed from the Asus WRT device tracker. Uh, groups will now reflect an assumed state if any member entity has an assumed state and support for Python 3.14 has been added. Any zone entities created via the mobile app integration will now correctly handle friendly names. In OMVIF go to preset commands, the speed parameter is now optional and creating config entries during re-authentication or reconfiguration flows will now fail if it's invalid. The LG WebOS TV entity availability has been updated to now better reflect the actual device status. I can hear cheers in the background. And finally, the TrackCar server integration now uses API token authentication instead of the legacy credentials. So that's it. That's what the 2025.11 release of Home Assistant has lined up for us. What's your favorite from the update? Let me know in the comments below. I think it's great to see the continued improvements to the UI taking place. The team really trying hard to make Home Assistant more accessible for everyone to use and great to see them revisiting previous changes and improving upon those. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more of these, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And whilst you're there, why not hit the hype button as well, as they all help other people get to see the video as well. But as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.